Today, the African Development Bank and the Global Center on Adaptation, GCA, uh, brought together African heads of state and government for a virtual leaders' dialogue on the Africa COVID climate emergency. Now, the AFDB and the GCA are combining their expertise, resources and networks to develop and implement a bold new Africa Adaptation Acceleration Programme to advance a three-pronged approach to address COVID-19, climate change and the continent's emerging economic challenges. AFDB President uh, Akunmi Adesina said that during an inaugural ministerial dialogue on adaptation action held as part of uh, the summit, our ambition is bold to galvanize climate resilience actions, support countries to accelerate and scale up climate adaptation and resilience, and mobilize financing at a scale for climate adaptation in Africa. Well, to tell us more about this initiative, we spoke to the CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation, Patrick Vokoyan. I think today was a breakthrough uh, for the continent. Why? COVID-19 COVID has ushered the world in an era of multiple interconnected uh, systemic shocks. And nowhere, quite frankly, Peter, is this more true in Africa. Some have even said that the continent is at risk of some have called a vaccine apartheid. At the same time, Africa is also disproportionately impacted by claimed climate change, has limited fiscal space, credit ratings at risks, and also limited borrowing capacity. So what we have been doing today is bringing over 30 world leaders today, brought together, and have said, okay, the problem is clear. Africa is, in, in essence, a victim to climate change. It's only contributing about 5% of of global greenhouse emissions globally, but is bearing the brunt of all the impacts. More floods, more droughts, more storms, more cyclones. And we want to change the narrative and see whether the international community can partner with Africa to deliver financing at scale. That's what happened today. I think we reached a very significant commitment for many world leaders. Now, obviously, going forward, to the very important COP26, the climate summit towards the end of the year, we want to capitalize on these commitments with concrete financial contributions from across the globe for Africa. These financial contributions and this partnership, how will that translate into action uh, for the continent? What will we start to see happening? A very good question. It's one thing to commit to invest in, say, climate adaptation. Let's think about this. In the last year or so, global economies committed to over 20 trillion US dollars in restarting the economy. We have a once in a lifetime opportunity to build a climate smart, safe, inclusive economy for the continent. What do we need? We need those investments in the recovery efforts also to take into account climate risks. What is good for health, good for the economy, and good for the planet. So investments in climate smart agriculture, investments in resilient infrastructure. We need to look at all our investments through a climate lens and then provide the resources adequately needed. I mean, Peter, the, the reality is this. Climate adaptation projects, be it in, in, in agriculture, be it in infrastructure, be it in water security, is happening on the continent, but not at the scale which is required. A very, let's say, dark fact is this. Only 3% of all climate finance worldwide is going to Africa. That has to change. The conversation today was very clear. World leaders are committing to additional resources. But at the end of the day, the metrics of success for all of us is it has to translate into those living on the front lines. Their lives need to be better. And, and that is what uh, we, we, we saw today with strong commitments from world leaders um, from the continent itself, but also from Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, Kristalina Georgieva, 
of the International Monetary Fund, of France, of Germany, of the United States. They all stand ready to engage with Africa. Now it's up to us to make it happen. There's no doubt that uh, the situation is urgent given the massive uh, weather uh, um, uh, uh, effects that we've seen on the continent uh, in the past decades. Um, and the loss uh, that we continue to experience in terms of agricultural output, etc. But how does one scale up quickly? And how quickly do you think it can be done to scale up this uh, uh, adapt adaptation uh, for, and acceleration uh, for fighting climate change on the continent? Well, thank you so much, Peter. It's exactly the point. It's scale and it is speed. We know what is working on the continent. We know which practices we should use in agriculture. We know how to build our cities better, taking into account climate risk. That's precisely why we as Global Center on Adaptation, we're the only international organization exclusively focused on climate adaptation, while we are partnering with the African Development Bank. The African Development Bank has already committed in the next five years 25 billion US dollars for the continent alone. What we now committed to, together with the African Development Bank and world leaders, is to double that amount in the coming years. Where is that money going to come from? Partly from domestic resources, partly from international partners, but also we need to bring the private sector to the table because it's also in their interest that their supply chains, that their businesses, and are climate smart. So I think, uh, Peter, there is a lot to play for in the coming months and years ahead. But I think today we had this breakthrough on climate adaptation where we all realize the pathway of the past cannot be the pathway of the future. Let's use this sort of reality of COVID as a warning sign, as a wake up call that we utterly unprepared for the next crisis the climate crisis, but we still have time. We have time to change our pathways, and that's what we need to do, and that's what we are committed to do uh, together with African leaders uh, on the continent. I think you've uh, partly answered my next question, and it's really about who is responsible then in making this happen. You've mentioned the private sector, uh, but I suppose governments will also have to take the lead in, in getting this done. Well, it's an all of society effort. It's government leaders, heads of states and government, it's ministers of finance, it's city mayors, it's the private sector, it's citizens, it's science. The battle against climate change will be decided in cabinet rooms, boardrooms, kitchen tables, laboratories, but it has to be brought together. It has to add up. What is very important to realize is climate adaptation, climate impacts is a reality already for the continent today. What do we know? Seven to $15 billion of costs are already contributed to the African economies today. This will increase of the climate impacts, 50 billion by 2040. Africa is already paying the price. Let's make sure now that we mobilize the resources from all sides of the world to change that narrative. It's not only a moral responsible thing to do, it's also economic, the right thing to do. In addition to adaptation, it's important that the United States, that the European Union, that China also reduce their carbon footprint. We cannot adapt to a three degree warmer world. We're currently on a trajectory that the world will increase with three degrees warm. We have agreed in Paris that we will limit the threshold of warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Today, where are we? 1.2 degrees warmer already. And where are the costs? In Africa. So we're calling upon other partners in the world to really come on board in Africa in this journey, because what's happening in Africa will not stay in Africa. What is projected? massive migration in the coming years ahead. Some of these internally displaced people will stay in Africa, others will go to the European continent. So it's also in the interest of Europe 
to come forward with significant scaled up financing. That's what we expect. That was on the table. And that's what we would like to see in the coming months ahead of Glasgow uh, COP26. The question might be then, are the big powers of the world really committed to this? We hear of solutions such as um, carbon credits, uh, but one gets a sense that, uh, you know, if you can pay off your sins, then you can sleep at night. But that's not really helping the story overall, is it? We've got the US, we've got China, some of the biggest polluters in the world. Um, are you convinced that they're committed to this change? Well, Peter, if you would have asked me this question three months ago before the US election, my answer would be, no, I'm not convinced. Now, under the Biden administration, things are happening. They're back in the Paris Agreement, one. They're coming forward with uh, domestic commitments, how to retool the, the US economy. But what we need, we need strong commitments of the United States, of the Biden administration, to deliver on their climate finance promise. Six years ago in Paris, the developed nations promised 100 billion US dollars flowing from north to south, particularly to Africa. So can we already go to sleep that this is, is gonna happen with the United States? Lots to play for. The noises from Washington are good, but we want to see concrete dollars flowing from Washington to the continent. That needs to happen in the next uh, a few months and years ahead. So um, I'm optimistic that the United States is committed to this agenda. It still remains to be seen whether they will come forward with really significant financial contributions, which quite frankly, Peter, are commensurate to the scale of the problem. We're talking about, as you suggested, scale and speed, we have no time to waste. Today was a breakthrough, but it was one point on the journey. Two weeks from now, I'm sure you're covering this, Biden is bringing together world leaders to talk about climate change. Well, what we have discussed today, if you, President Biden, are talking climate change in two weeks from now, let's talk Africa. Let's talk adaptation. And what are you gonna put on the table? Remains to be seen. Today, the United States was very forward-leaning, but it has to be translated into concrete dollars flowing to the continent. That is what success is and nothing else. Let's talk a little bit about um, our continent and some of the things that we're doing here and forced to do just because we're not as developed as the rest of uh, the, the world in, in, in parts. So South Africa, for example, very dependent on fossil fuel, uh, coal uh, to power our economy. That's not going to change anytime soon. But yet, the more we do it, the more we're contributing to this climate change problem. How do we reconcile where we are in reality and what needs to be done? Where does adaptation come into play for a country like South Africa that's so dependent on fossil fuels. Very good point. I mean, the broader point is the climate agenda has two sides. On the one side, we need to lower our carbon emissions. while at the same time, we need to adapt to the changes in the climate which are happening already today. More floods, more droughts, more storms, more cyclones. We need to do both. The IMS, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund came forward and said, well, this is the time also for South Africa to, to join the journey towards a green economy. It's not only good for um, the economy itself because it provides jobs, it will provide economic returns. Every dollar invested in climate adaptation, be it in early warning systems, agroforestry, infrastructure development, has a four to $10 of return on its investment. It's not only the right thing to do, it's the smartest thing to do, it's good economics. 